A's Noodles and the O-Dog on TSN 1050. Count it up, count it up, count it up, count it, count it up, count it up, count it up, count it, count it up. Final hour overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line of the final score. Brian Hayes, Dave Festruck of the Toronto Star. We got Mike uh, Mark Feinstein later this hour of uh, MLB Network. Get his take on the Jays getting a win today. They're off to Seattle. They got the Mariners this weekend. What's up with the American League East where, you know, last night, Jays lose, mm -hmm. Boston loses, New York loses, Tampa loses, Baltimore gets a win. Tampa's come right back down to earth. Yeah. Like the Rays are basically a 500 club the last two months. And the Yankees are just They're useless a mess. without Aaron Judge. Like they can't They're a hit mess without, without Aaron Judge. Judge. Yeah. You got Carlos Rodon, who's, you know, their newest signing and a guy they paid a lot of money to, and he's really struggled. He's blowing kisses to fans when he's getting lit up on Not the Not a good move. Not good in New York, right? No. no. He didn't do it in New York. No, but, but it was Yankee gets, fans heckling him. When he gets back to New York, he's going to hear about it. Oh, yeah. I guarantee it. You could tell after the game. I thought he handled it really well. He did. His post-game interview explaining it and saying, listen, I'm angry. I get it. Others are angry. I'm struggling. But you got to watch yourself, right? If you're a Yankee, you're getting paid big money. Now, it sounds like it's Aaron Boone is the guy that's getting the most, you know, heat being placed on oh, him. Oh, yeah. But I don't know. I'm not sure he's going anywhere. I mean, Cashman – has always kind of supported Boone and well without Judge, like you said, the Yankees just aren't that good. Well, I wonder is is the pressure on Cashman to go get Otani, you know, and and revive this season. Ooh, you think that would even do it? I mean, might Otani not. might look at it and say that's the Angels, right? Like Mike Trout's on the IL, yeah. so is Aaron Judge. What the hell am I going to do with that team? Well, we had Brett Boone, Aaron Boone's brother, on the show when you were away, Hayes, and mm -hmm. he was saying it, he thought this was at the All-Star break, and he was saying Judge was going to be back right after the All-Star break, according to one of his sources, who he stressed was not his brother. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but who knows? Who knows when Judge is coming back, and who knows what Judge is going to be, right? Like, you know, it's not like, you know, this is a fairly, a, a fairly major injury, this big toe problem he's got, and it's... He's coming back earlier than he probably would like if he's coming back at all. And the idea that he's just going to kind of waltz in there and become, you know, the, the AL record-setting home run king again just, you know, overnight is kind of unrealistic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there's a lot of heat on, on New York. It's quiet in Boston because I think most yeah. people are anticipating they wouldn't be really a competitive team anyway. No expectation. But it's Boston. Right. You know, like considering it's the Red Sox, it, it is amazing how muted they've been basically since the Mookie Betts trade, yeah. I would say. And that doesn't mean it's not loud in Boston and the Red Sox aren't still being covered. But I find on a national level, no one's talking about Boston. No, they're irrelevant. Yeah. They've really slipped out of the out of the spotlight. And when you think about how oversaturated the market was there for so many years when the AL East was playing each other 19 times a year and it mm -hmm. seemed like Yankees Red Sox was on TV all the time Every right night, yeah. it was like all it was all ESPN covered was Yankees Red Sox right and uh you're right it's it's kind of shocking how they've just kind of slipped into the the irrelevancy category in Major League Baseball that's right well Jay Seattle uh this weekend so Mark Feinstein later this hour uh we'll head to Australia here in just a moment catch up with Claire Hanna who uh, is used to living and working in Ottawa. Now she's in Australia, and what I'm seeing is it looks like it's basically late fall in Ottawa down there. Right, It's like 7 Chilly. degrees. Yeah, it's yeah. cold, man. They're wearing jackets and gloves, and uh, you got Canada versus Nigeria tonight. And I want to ask Claire what she's hearing about the role Christine Sinclair is going to play. Yes. Here, because Christine is not young. Um, I think this is her sixth World Cup. Which is, it is incredible. Yeah, 40 years old. Um, obviously, she played an integral role in the Olympic Games and the gold medal that was won a couple of years ago, which was incredible. The last time we were at really like a major, major tournament like mm -hmm. this, Canada prevailed and, and won gold. Um, but Christine Sinclair, I, I've noticed it's kind of difficult to get an answer from the coach. A lot of hemming and hawing. A yeah. lot of kind of avoiding mm. exactly what kind of role Christine is going to play. And maybe the great distraction is trying to find out what the nickname is going to be for this <laughs> team. Because we talked about this a couple hours ago where I saw Fox Sports tweeted out, others have tweeted out, you know, FIFA letting the world know, you know, all the teams that are playing at the FIFA Women's World Cup, what the team's nickname is. 
And the only team, the only country without a nickname is Canada for some reason. Bizarre. And it is bizarre. No official nickname. That's their new <laughs> it's, nickname. It's shocking. There's no official nickname. Like, you can't come up with something on the fly. Seriously. Come on. Someone's got to get creative down there. We got a lot of creative people down there for TSN. I mean, and maybe they can create something. In fact, we have one of those uh, very talented people on the line right now. And she's down there at the uh, World Cup in Australia. And you got Canada versus Nigeria tonight on TSN. Here is Claire Hanna. Claire, can you come up with a nickname on the fly here for the Canadian team? Okay, I got it. Maple Ruse. Perfect. All right. Send there it. we go. I, I kind of, I'm kind of stealing it from like the um, the volley ruse, which are like a volleyball team. Back. Let's do the maple ruse. I Perfect. Like it. I like Send it. the email out. Someone's got to get it. We got to get this established before kickoff, <laughs> right? We got four and a half hours. Yeah. We need to have a nickname. The mooseys? Like I don't know if that's a little too cute. Something like a play on moose, m- moose maple. I'm not sure. You, I'm sure we can figure out something with the help of Canada. Okay, yes. everybody listening right now. Tweet in, what's your favorite nickname for Team Canada? Something has to happen, and someone has to get creative, and I think we're on to something. All right, we will establish that between now and kickoff tonight, 10.30 Eastern time. And we were just talking about Christine Sinclair and trying to get a read on, you know, what kind of role she's going to have where, you know, the previous five World Cups she was in, you knew the role, superstar, right? Like everything's going yeah. through yeah. Christine. Um, it doesn't sound as if that's necessarily going to be the case. Uh, what are you hearing on that front, Claire, in terms of, you know, how integral of a role Christine Sinclair is going to play in Canada's pursuit at this World Cup? Okay, well, first of all, guys, it's Christine Sinclair, like one of the greatest of all time, the international goal-scoring leader. I don't think her role necessarily, you know, is going to change that much when you think about the personality she brings, the desire, the passion. You know, is she probably still doing some of the key speeches leading into matches. Yes. Are they looking to her for veteran experience? Yes. Are the young players kind of intimidated by her when they first get on the team? Yes. Do they realize she's a really awesome person and so down to earth? Also, yes. Like these are such key components to Christine Sinclair and her persona and her aura. Those will never change. And I think those are the most important parts of her role Um, on the field. Yes. We've seen her be such a clutch goal scorer. I definitely think she's still going to be the type of person you see in the starting 11. But over the past 12 months, even in some of the friendlies this year, we typically see her come out at some point in the game. Um, And I think that's because you're also seeing some really great up-and-coming players for Canada, okay? There's always a changing of the guard. For six World Cups, she's 40 years old. There's definitely going to be a young 20-year-old who's kind of pushing her, whether that's Jordan Heidema, whether that's, you know, Adriana Leon, those kind of players. And so I think that you're going to see fewer minutes for Christine Sinclair in these matches. But, like, when she's on the field, she's still going to have that crazy fire in her eyes. And so, to me, that's so contagious for the rest of the team that maybe that doesn't really matter. Claire, when you look at the way Canada is sort of being covered internationally, along with being mocked for not having a nickname widely, um, it seems to me like they're being overlooked as a competitive force given that they are the defending olympic gold medalists which was an awfully tough tournament to win back in tokyo only a couple of summers ago and you know given that they are the heck they're world number seven they're the highest ranked group in the fifa women's rankings uh in their group is what i'm trying to say australia's 10th um nigeria's 40th and yet they're not the yeah, favorites. They're not the favorites to win it, right? And w- what do you make of that? Are they are they happy to be kind of overlooked, or, or do they feel disrespected, or should they, you know, should they embrace either direction? Okay, so lots of constant themes here. They keep saying, "Yeah, we don't get the credit we deserve internationally." You'd think after winning an Olympic gold medal, they would be one of the teams that would always be considered a contender. But they also don't mind that underdog mentality because that's the exact same way they went into the Tokyo Olympics, which they ended up winning. So it's almost like recreating those vibes and energy they had in Tokyo because that was obviously the secret sauce. So they like the fact that they're – there's okay, there's definitely a bit of a target on their back. You know, I was speaking with the Nigerians yesterday, and they're like, yeah, we're playing the Olympic gold medalists. Of course, we're a little intimidated. So there's always, like, that swag that's going to go with the team. But then when you think about – um, just, yeah, the fact that nobody's got them as favorites. I look at ESPN top 10 players and there's never a Canadian on it. Or the fact that Kaylin Sheridan was nominated, or she was the NWSL 
goalkeeper of the year but wasn't even nominated for the FIFA goalkeeper of the year. All of those things considered um, definitely make Canada feel that disrespect, but it's, it's not like they care. They don't mind. They'll take that because that's what really fuels them to want to be their best and to want to prove everybody wrong exactly like they did in Tokyo. With Claire Hanna of TSN, she's in Australia. It's uh, Canada versus Nigeria tonight, 10.30 p.m. Eastern time kickoff. Um, you know, Dave referenced the, the group and you know who they're going up against and it feels like nigeria is a team they probably have to take advantage of don't they claire like may not be a must win it's the first match of the tournament but the group stage can fly by yeah, you look what happened on the men's side they played belgium really quality in that first match but they got a draw out of it where they probably felt they should have got three points um it does it feel that way around the camp that they realize you know this nigerian team is one that it, it, they got to try to get a win here and, and it might be imperative in terms of finding a way to get through the group stage. Okay, well, I think to the outsiders looking in, when you look at Nigeria ranked 40th, Canada ranked 7th, um, it seems like, yeah, okay, this is a must win, but I don't think the Canadians are taking any team lightly. They're taking every match like, okay, this is an American-type team. They need to give everything they've got on the pitch because these teams can be really sneaky and really scary. And they faced Nigeria two times last year in friendlies. Canada won the first match 2-0. But then in the second match, Nigeria was up 2-0. And it was like a big comeback for Canada to just get a draw in that match. And so th that's a pretty recent reminder in Canadians' minds, or the Canadian team's minds. And then also, there's a player for Nigeria. Her name's Asisat Ashola. She just won Champions League with Barcelona. Get this. She has 83 goals in 89 appearances. That's like a crazy high stat when you think about soccer and football. And she wasn't... Um, on the Nigerian squad during those friendlies. And she's definitely a scoring threat. So that's an added component to Nigeria. So while you might look at it and think, okay, this is like, you know, a gimme game or one that they've got to win, it's going to be a tough one. But I think, I think it's good that Canada's kind of got this test early on because it gets them in the zone. You know, the first match of World Cup, Kadisha Buchanan was telling me, you know what, no doubt, we're going to feel nervous coming onto the pitch. There's like, it's big. There's lights everywhere. There's FIFA signage. So get the nerves out but bring your a game but, but this is one they definitely want to get three points in claire what do you what do you make of the weather conditions i mean we're hayes and i were just talking about how you know, <laughs> looking at some of the fans in the stands today watching a bit of the australia game you know there's people in parkas and gloves and hats and it was what nine celsius in sydney i think it's going to be right now it's something like seven celsius in melbourne where Canada's going to play in a few hours uh you know, you don't think of yeah, Australia as a cold weather I'm place, but what do you make of it? No, okay, Brian, are you just trying to get me to talk about my gloves? Okay, yes. so you really gave it to me at the Phoenix Open, and yes. I'm wearing mittens again. I feel like I'm always <laughs> wearing gloves when I make it on this show. That's right. But it's chilly, and okay, I keep hearing back home how it's gorgeous. Like Aussie winters, they're no joke. I I feeling like it's that drizzly chilly windy vancouver day in november okay um but today is pretty nice okay i'm i'm just sitting in what row four behind one of the goals or one of the you know goalkeeping nets and there's just a few clouds in the sky it's crisp it feels like one of those nice fall mornings um the sun's out we just had a nice sunrise it was like all pink and purple um, I can see our crew sending up Lindsay Hamilton and the girls were just doing a hit for sports center. And it's a nice feeling. Like I walked in and I could see these, these kids outside. I think they were probably going to be the ball distributor kids. And like, they're just laughing around. Like there's, there's great energy in the city right now. Okay. But it is cold. I'm just trying not to think about the cold, you guys, because I, right. you know, it's bikini weather back home. It's beautiful here. It is absolutely. Although, I mean, there's a kind of crazy weather storming through the Toronto area right now. But for the most part, it's been high 20s and sunny, right, Dave? It's been beautiful. Wonderful. Here, yeah, it has been. So um, take that yeah. for what it's worth. Let's just put it this way. If you were, if you were going to golf, you'd definitely want to wear pants and, like, a rain jacket, okay? okay. You wouldn't yep. be out here, you know, working on your calf tan. That's not good. That's not what we want to hear July 20th. But, uh, listen, that won't matter once we, we get going here. It's uh, <laughs> Canada Nigeria tonight at 10 30 it's going to be fun uh, i know you've been down there for a while so stay warm enjoy the coverage and we'll catch you tonight and uh thank you for doing this we appreciate it thank you guys you got it there's uh claire 
Hannah of TSN down in Australia. Been down there for a couple of weeks already. I think she's down there for like six or seven weeks. It's a long more. tournament, man. It's a long haul of the World Cup. If you make, if Canada makes it to the final, they're going to be there for like month plus. So it's almost right. two months. Yeah, that's right. It's crazy how long yep. you're down there. Yeah. You're down there for but, a long, long time. But this is the first year, apparently, this first Women's World Cup pays where they've actually given the, each team an actual base camp where they have, like, the hotel and, and the practice field all in the same facility. Apparently, that hadn't been the standard in the Women's World Cup, even though it had been the standard in the Men's World Cup. So I think it's going to make it a little better for the for the players. Yeah, well, that's been, you know, something that I know the Canadian players have talked about, the difference between the Olympics and the World Cup and how many days off you get at the World Cup. Right. Too, right, where the Olympics is – two weeks and go, like go, that's go. it it's go yeah. go 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 world cup you're talking four or five days in between matches sometimes yeah so you got to be comfortable and, yes. and apparently in previous world cups they, a lot of these teams would you know they'd have to go to this place for this you know these few days before this match and then they'd go to a new hotel and find a new practice facility and and have you know busting around and flying around and it added to the, the like you know it adds to the grind of the whole thing absolutely right? Yep, so. for sure. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see. Canada, Nigeria tonight, 10.30 kickoff right here on TSN. And uh, we got Mark Feinstein later this hour. We'll uh, also continue to look ahead to day two of the Open Championship at Royal Liverpool. Get you an update on what happened day one a little bit later this hour. Overdrive continues, TSN 1050 and on the TSN app. All right, Mark Feinstein coming up of MLB Network. Jays with a win this afternoon. They get one of three against San Diego. That Padres team, I'm sure a lot of people bought tickets during the offseason knowing San Diego was coming up. Yeah. Right. Marquee with, team. Yeah, with Tatis and, and with Soto. And Machado. And, and Machado, and they got Bogarts. Like, that's yeah. the one through four of the lineup today. Um, they got big names on the mound. They got big names in the bullpen. High expectations between them and the Mets. Like, those are the two most disappointing teams in the league. Oh, by far. Yeah. yeah. Massive payrolls, and and it's just not working for them. But, you know, obviously, if you were there over the last few days, you saw a, a Padres team look pretty good, but the Jays mm -hmm. got one today. And Chris Bassett had another really good start. Really good. Like, really good start. And this is where the Jays are at. Like, you're just waiting for Manoa. And I, I don't know how much more you can wait, but if he were what he was a year ago. Oh, my God. If you had last year's Manoa into Gosman, into Bassett, into a redeemed Barrios, yeah, that's a great one through four. Awfully good. Yeah, Awfully like good. Uh, basically all you could ask for, you know, in in terms of production. Yeah. Well, now you got now you got to hold out hope that a Manoa figures out a way to turn it around between now and the playoffs, which I'm not sure is a particularly likely thing, or you got to hope that Ryu. Who's pitching? What he's pitching with Buffalo tomorrow, I believe, in his, you know, Tommy John rehab, and it's continuing now in AAA. And there's some optimism haze that he can be back at some point and fill in the gap. But if that seems like fool's gold. That's too, what I'm saying. Though, they both it, seem like fool's gold, and and therefore, which brings us to now on August first, you got to get another arm. Yeah. Yeah, it seems that way. And, and it seems the way, like, I know Ross was saying yesterday that it'd be more of a depth arm bullpen with some arm. options and a bullpen arm and maybe a right-handed bat that basically comes off the bench. Like, right. he didn't indicate they're going big game hunting. No. That did not sound like the indication. And that would be consistent with the way they've operated before. Remember last year, it was incredibly disappointing. Oh, yeah. Trade deadline. Incredibly mm -hmm. disappointing considering where they were at and what people thought they could build towards. And I, I understand the need for internal improvement. You know, we talked about it with Scotty earlier. Any combination of Chapman, Varsho, Kirk coming to life and showing any pulse at the plate would be significant. And then obviously Vladdy being the elephant in the room, right? Like Vladdy, yes, he's got high expectations, but it's 100% warranted. Right. It's it should be expected. An yeah. Uber talent like that who's done it before, he's got to be better than what he's been all year. Oh yeah. And or I guess the, the other alternative is that guy we saw two seasons ago had hit 48 home runs and was, you know, in the in the running to be AL MVP if not for the phenomena that is Shohei Otani. Maybe that was a one off. Maybe mm -hmm. he's maybe he's something closer to what we're seeing now. Possibly. I mean, I and don't know. It maybe it was a product of of Dunedin and Buffalo. Too, right yeah. where he was lighting well, those parks there up. There was that. 
that that was an element, but that's, you know, still 48 is 48, and other guys were playing in those parks, and they weren't hitting to the same level, and he had an OPS, I believe, up over 1,000. He was a machine that year. He was. You know, he was an absolute machine, and I would lean towards, obviously, the talent being closer to that version of, of Vladdy, but um, we have not seen that at any point this year. No. You know, at any point this year, as he looked like a guy who's about to explode and, and return to superstardom. Um, so I'm assuming that if the Jays are just going to kind of approach the deadline with a similar approach to the one that they've had in years past, where they will make moves, they will make improvements, but they'll be incremental and largely fringe pieces yeah. and largely conservative. I guess what Atkins is probably going to be telling that clubhouse is it's got to be internal, yeah. which might speak to Manoa or speak to Ryu. Like, basically, we're relying on one of you guys coming to life. I don't see Ryu being – I just don't think it's fair to a guy who's 36 coming off Tommy John who yeah. wasn't that good before Tommy John. I was going to say. Right? Like, he was really struggling prior to it, and possibly that was injury-related. But this is not a guy who throws smoke. No. If he loses any velocity, it's an even bigger issue. Right. Um, so, R Ryu – and he'll be on a, a pitch count. He'll be on an innings count. It's difficult to ease a guy into your starting rotation. Like, Chad Green's going to be a different situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like he comes in. It's like, can you give us one inning at a time? Right. Give us three outs at a time. Ryu, you can't pencil him in for a start and say, give us two innings. No. You know, the guy's got to be willing to, to give you something in the tank every fifth day. And I don't think they want to go with a six-man rotation, nor should they, wow. considering Gosman, Bassett, and Barrios have been so good. That's exactly it. That that hurts those guys. Exactly. That hurts those guys. So, you're right. No, there's, but you know what? You know, when, you, when you've heard sort of – Atkins speak on this, and you read between the lines, it, it sounds like your point. Like, there's been a lot of hints that they'd rather see internal improvement yep. than bring somebody in or, you know, spend a lot of assets. Like, let's face it, they don't – their prospect pool, when you read the, the scouting reports in their prospect pool, they don't exactly have a deep one. No. It's not like they've got a lot, of, a lot in the cupboard with which to trade for the now run at another playoffs. Right. right? It's not jumping off the page. No. I mean, it's they not. gave you know the you know Gabriel Marino was the big piece, and they and they gave him up in the Varsho trade. So, right. so that was you know, and that was a go for it move. You got to it may, it may turn out to be a really bad move now that Varsho hasn't shown up with the kind of production they would they would hope he would have. But um, you got to give him you know the the credit for at least taking the swing. Well, and that's largely what they've done. I mean, the Barrio still was a deadline deal. Yeah, you know, in and around it. Anyway, it was halfway through. So I don't recall the exact date, but it You're was right, leading up, was up in, to a deadline a couple deadline of years window, ago. Yeah. But with the understanding that there would be team control and they get something done there, um, you know, they usually they go big game hunting in the off season. You know, that's when they that's the philosophy of of philosophy of this front office. You know, and, yeah, and they're they're probably not alone in that. And you know, you take Otani out of it. <laughs> It's difficult to know exactly what the market is. Who's available right now? How many guys are actually available that could truly have impact right. on your team? But I, I think, you know, I think they need another starter, and I think they need – I think it would be valuable to have another power arm. You can never have enough of those. You can't. If you can find another truly power arm that can come out of the bullpen, you can bolster what's been a strength for them. I was going to say, you, it's not like the bullpen's been a weakness. No, it hasn't. No one's going to suggest as much. I mean, they've been right up there in strikeouts. They've been they've been effective. But you're right. If you look at the teams that have gone deep in the playoffs, so often they've just had this murderer's row of power arms, right? Yep. And and you got to account for you know the potential for injuries, and you you can't have enough of them. That's right. Yep, you can never have enough of them. That's the truth. And we're, we're getting close to that trade deadline. Again, the Jays with a 4 nothing win earlier today. They're off to Seattle, heading out to the West Coast. Mariners' three-game series starting tomorrow night. Here's Mark Feinstein of MLB Network and MLB.com. How you doing, Mark? I'm good. How are you guys? We're doing well. We're trying to read the tea leaves on what Ross Atkins and company could do leading up to the trade deadline. And Ross spoke yesterday and kind of indicated depth, starter maybe a piece for the bullpen maybe a depth right-handed bat but basically largely conservative much like they were last year at the deadline uh, is that what you're bracing for from the Jays yeah I could see them upgrading the rotation I think you know there's still enough questions about Alec Manoa that you probably would benefit from adding a you know a proven starter um, you know you can never have too much pitching obviously this time of year and certainly in September and October um, you know Manoa's start two starts ago was really encouraging, and then the last one, not so much. So, 
Um, you know, there are several starting pitchers out there to be had. Uh, it would not surprise me if Toronto ended up going for one of them. But beyond that, I think it's just tweaking on the margins. I, like you said, maybe a right-handed bat. Um, but I don't, I don't think they're going to be, um, you know, maybe on the more aggressive side of some of the teams we're going to see. Well, what do you see, Mark, when you look at the, you know, the greater market for Shohei Otani? And if we don't still know if Artie Moreno, the owner in in uh, Anaheim, is going to make that move and, and put him on the market. A lot of speculation around that. Um, but how many teams do you actually think are, are, if they do indeed want to trade him, how many teams are actually realistically, in your mind, in the running uh, to get this guy? Oh, I think you could you could have a half a dozen teams potentially in the mix because this is going to be the one time where money is not the issue. I mean, as long as you're willing to take on the you know $10 million or so that he's owed for the rest of the season, uh, if you have the prospects and you have the winning bid in terms of the, the biggest, biggest and best prospect package, uh, I think he's, uh, you know, he's there for the taking if they trade him. Now, that said, we just watched them sweep the Yankees. They're four and a half games out of a playoff spot. Uh, they've got another easy week coming up ahead of them here, and they could really inch closer to that playoff spot. And, and I've spoken to some executives who think Artie Moreno might be looking for uh, sort of any excuse not to trade him because he knows what Otani means to them business-wise and on the field and off the field. And, um, you know, I think he'd be just as happy to not trade him and, and you know, sort of let the chips fall they may, try to get a little closer and wait for Trout to come back. Uh, that said, after this week of uh, a pretty easy schedule, they have a brutal gauntlet in August. Uh, they play eight straight series against difficult teams. So um, you, you, if you're an Angel fan, you're almost hoping uh, maybe they don't have a huge week this week. Maybe they don't inch closer, <laughs> and it pushes them towards trading them. Because, you know, baseball-wise, there's really no, no argument in favor of keeping them. Um, you know, they're not going to resign him at the end of the year. I think that's pretty clear. The only way they resign him at the end of the year is if they get to the playoffs and make a little noise there. And he believes that, that this is a team that, you know, can build upon what they have and win. Um, but if you don't think you're going to resign him, I don't know how you don't trade him because the, the draft picks you're going to get for him are going to pale in comparison to the package you could get for him from a contender right now. With Mark Feinstein of MLB Network and MLB.com, um, you know, we'd love to see it up here in Toronto. I don't get the sense that the Jays would be a team kicking tires because of the nature of their front office. And, you know, they're not, they don't have a stacked uh, farm system either. So, you know, can they put the pieces together that would be necessary? Um, that's kind of undetermined at this point. But how would you handicap the likeliness of Otani if he becomes available ending up in the AL East? Um, I think there's a decent chance, and mostly, and not with the teams that you'd expect, because um, the Yankees' farm system is okay, but not great. Same with the Red Sox. They've got a few high-end guys, but I don't think High and Bloom's going to be moving any of them uh, for a two-month rental. The Orioles and the Rays have two of the deepest farm systems in the game, and if either of those teams believed that they would have a chance to you know, get to the World Series with the addition of Shohei Otani, uh, that's an interesting thing to think about because, you know, those are teams that when he becomes a free agent in, uh, in November, you know, they're not even on the radar. They're not even a, 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 you know, there's no dream scenario of him ending up with either of them. Um, but this is an opportunity where he doesn't have a no trade clause. He can't say no. And you've got more than enough prospect capital to try to get them. So, um, you know, either of those two teams would be really interesting to me if they decided, you know what, I, we're going to go all in for this year and try to, uh, make some noise, and you know, knowing that you can unload three, four, five, six prospects and still have a really deep farm system. Well, you talk about the Yankees, Mark, and obviously, you know, you, you, you point out their farm system is not particularly strong, but we have had you know quite a few baseball insiders. I know Buster only has been very forceful in saying the Yankees, if indeed Otani is on the market, the Yankees would be a front runner to get him. And yet, you look at the Yankees in last place in the AL East. I mean, would it make sense for them? to go all in and get Otani in a year like this in your mind with, with Judge still hurt and them not being able to hit without Judge. Uh, is this a team even worthy of betting on if you're Brian Cashman in the general manager's seat? It's a good question. I'm not sure that I would if I was Brian Cashman. I think, you know, look, the Yankees have the prospects to, to get a deal done, but they'd have to give up, you know, three or four of their top five to make it happen. And at that point, you're really looking at, uh, you know, just completely desecrating your farm system. They only have two top 100 
prospects as it is right now. Um, and the way they're they're playing right now, I don't know that I would be willing to bet. I mean, you know, so let's say obviously adding him to that lineup and Judge is going to be back soon certainly makes him a lot more of a threat. Uh, adding him to their rotation is something they can certainly use. Um, but the cost of it, I'm not sure it's worth it for a team that even with Otani, are they the favorites in the American League? I'm not sure they would be. Um, you know, this team has gone through a really bad stretch here. Uh, and we've seen that, uh, you know, they're going to get swept by the Angels. They lost a series to the Rockies. And this was supposed to be a week out of the All-Star break that was supposed to get them really healthy and feeling good about themselves. And instead, uh, it sent them into a bit of a spiral. So um, I don't know that this team is good enough to, to really make noise, even with Shohei Otani. Um, and I think, uh, you know, giving up your, you know, the three or four top duels in your farm system, I'm not sure that makes sense. With Mark Feinstein, MLB Network, MLB.com. Uh, you mentioned earlier, at this point, it's not about money with Shohei, but it will become about money at some point with Shohei Otani. And we all know it's going to be, you know, a ton of money. We just saw San Diego roll through town, and they took two of three against the Jays, but easily um, one of the two most disappointing teams in baseball this year based on payroll and expectations. They're five games under 500. The other team would be in New York. That'd be the Mets. Maybe the Yankees aren't far off being the third. Um, but the Mets are 45 and 51, Padres 46 and 51, and they spent a fortune, an absolute fortune. Um, what might the ripple effect be, league wide, from owners who look at that and say, "What's the point? Like, why? Look what happened. Look what happened in San Diego, New York. They pony out all this money, and it gets them nothing this season." Well, I think it, you look at how they spent it, right? The Mets have spent a lot of money on a pair of you know 38 and 40 year old pitchers. Um, you know, $86 million for Scherzer and Verlander, and that has not worked out the way they had hoped. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, I mean, between the two of them and Edwin Diaz, you've got over $100 million wrapped up in three pitchers. Um, so I, I think the Padres are an interesting team to watch in the next week um, or two weeks, I guess, 12 days, whatever it is, till the deadline, because if I was A.J. Preller, I'm not sure I would give up on them. They're still within shouting distance of a wild card spot. And if they get there and they go into a playoff series with Snell, Darvish, and Musgrove, and they have that lineup and it starts to click, and obviously if they get to the playoffs, then they will have obviously played well over the final two months, that's a team that can make some real noise in the, in the postseason. So, you know, you look at that team, you're like, how are they as bad as they are? I don't have an answer for that. Um, but if they have a bad week coming up, and they find themselves further out, let's say nine, ten games from a wild card, they could be the team that shapes the entire trade deadline. Blake Snell's been the best pitcher in baseball for over two months. His ERA is well under one during that stretch. Josh Hader, probably the best closer in baseball, or certainly top three. Uh, he's a free agent at the end of the year. Snell's a free agent at the end of the year. Soto's got one year left on his deal. Maybe they turn around and trade him if they decide to go sell mode. Um, the Padres would be a very popular team uh, A.J. Preller's cell phone number would be blowing up if they decide to go sell. Um, but I'm just not sure that that's going to happen unless they have a really, really bad 8 to 10 days coming up here. Mark, uh, word out that uh, Rob Manford, the Major League Baseball commissioner, is expected to be essentially reelected to a third term in that job, which apparently pays something in the range of uh, $25 million a year. Um What's your take on, on Manfred? Has, has this year, maybe with the pitch clock and some of the other improvements to the game, has this year maybe redeemed a little bit of his image? You know, for a guy who called the World Series trophy a piece of tin not too long ago? Or uh, where are you on Rob Manfred and uh, the good of the game? Well, let me preface this by saying I'm an employee of Major League Baseball. So, okay, uh, fair yeah, point. If you want me to come on here and crush the commissioner, that's not going to happen. Gotcha. That said, just looking at it objectively, uh, you know, there were certainly things that people, uh, criticisms people had of the commissioner that uh, were warranted. But uh, if you've ever seen anybody completely turn their reputation and their legacy around in the span of seven or eight months, yeah. I think he's done it this year because the rules changes have been nothing short of – uh, you know, a complete success for the league. Uh, I think the the pitch clock's been great. You know, the the bases. I think people sort of said, "Who cares if they make the bases bigger?" But that combined with the disengagement rule, you've got a lot more stolen bases this year. Games are a lot more exciting to watch. Um, you know, I think the shift rules have been great. I've really not run into anybody who has had a bad word to say about any of these rules 
save for a few veteran pitchers who aren't fans of the pitch clock because right. they've been doing the same thing for 15 or 18 years, and uh, these guys are creatures of habit and don't like change. But I think, you know, compared to where we were after the lockout ended to where we are now, uh, I think Manfred has completely turned his legacy around with these with these rules changes. Yeah, uh, like the pitch clock, that seemed like a – it made sense, right, immediately. And I think it's now that we've seen it and it's played out, um, that one clearly was was a move that I think the, the majority of fans have agreed with and understood the value in it. Attacking the shift was one that was really a volatile topic, mm-hmm. right, and polarizing one. Like, you know, why are you penalizing basically smart baseball? You know, like understanding this is where the guy's likely going to hit, so we're going to attack it. But that seems to have really quieted down as well. Uh, and maybe they coincide. Maybe it's that there's more action on the bases. You've got the idea that you could have a 40 and 40 guy this year in Acuna. Um, like, do you, do you sense the same thing, Mark? You're covering the game on a daily basis. Like, were you expecting more blowback? Because it, it seems to have been almost unanimously accepted, these rule changes. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the teams that, you know, used, used a lot of shifts were a little – if you on that to begin with, I think left-handed hitters were probably 100% in favor of it. Um, but I, if you just watch the game this year, it's more exciting. It's a it's a better product in yep. a in a better pace. You know, games you can. You know, I have friends who have younger children, and you know they can bring them to a game now. The, you know, a night game on a weeknight, and and you know, seven o'clock start, or some teams have even moved to six thirty. You're out of the ballpark by nine nine thirty. You're home by ten. Uh, and, and, you know, you can take your kids to a weeknight baseball game, which was just not really a, a reasonable thing to do when games were going 310, 320, 330. Um, you know, you have to leave after the sixth or seventh inning. So I just think the product has been better uh, in every aspect because of these rules. And, you know, I understand people say you're, you're penalizing smarter teams for, you know, the shift and everything. But, you know, at the end of the day, Major League Baseball is an entertainment product, right? They're, they're, their goal is to get more people watching and get more people engaged with the game. And I think you've done that this year because you have a lot more exciting games in the league this year because of these rule changes almost you know, entirely. So, um, yeah, I'm sure there are still a handful of people who uh, you know, don't like the shift rule or wish that you could do whatever you want defensively, but um, I just think overall. And you've also been able to see some of these players, you know, up the middle players who, you know, the shortstop who instead of, uh, moving over, you know, into short right field or whatever, has to play right on the other side of the bag, and you've seen just the athleticism in some of these guys uh, really shine through. So I, I'm, I've been all for it, and I think the, the vast majority of people who watch the game on a semi-regular basis um, probably feel the same. Well, the next big one, Mark, is going to be you know robo umpires, right? And I don't know if you've been down to watch much AAA baseball. I've certainly seen a few games over the last uh, year, and. You know, it's it's intrusive, right? Like, depending on which version of it you watch, they have two different versions going right now. One is just total robo-ump, you know, where essentially the, the machine calls the balls and strikes, and there's another one where there's a human ump, and you can over you can request to uh, review calls with the robo-ump. Um, and yet Manfred said they're not ready to bring it in next year, even though there was some expectations that next year it would be here. What do you make of that? Are you, th- is it, you still think it's coming, or are you hearing anything different, or, or where are we on robo-umps? I don't think we're going to go to full-on robo-umps anytime soon, uh, you know, where the, where the you know, computer is calling the, the balls and strikes on every pitch. Uh, the first time I'd seen it in person with the ABS of the challenge system was during the Futures game, and I loved it. It was um, – you know, the, it, it was you barely even realized it was happening until unless you were really paying attention. You know, the, the, the pitch comes in, they call the ball, they call the strike, the batter, or they call the strike, I guess, the batter just taps his head. Mm-hmm. And the umpire signals that he's challenging it, and literally within five seconds they get the word in their, in their ear whether it's overturned or, or it stands. So it takes no time at all. And, you know, I like the idea of each team having a few challenges a game, and if you get your challenge right, you don't lose it, um, because I don't think that it would really impact the pace of play. And you know what? Just like in some replay and every other sport, I think if you're going to get it right, if you can get it right, you should get it right. And obviously you're not going to be able to do it on, you know, borderline pitches. No one's going to, you know, unless it's a huge situation, no one's going to call for a challenge, um, you know, for a pitch that might be two inches off the plate. 
But when an umpire calls a, a, a strike on a ball that was, you know, six, eight inches off the plate, and, and these hitters know the strike zone so well, um, you know, they have the opportunity to challenge it. And uh, I think it's, I think that actually could be a, a pretty pretty good uh, addition to the league if they, if they decide to do that. But I don't know if or when that's going to happen. Always great catching up with you. Thank you, Mark. All right. Thanks, guys. Mark Feinstein, MLB.com, MLB Network Insider. Yeah, more challenge. Yeah, more challenges coming to pro sports. Yeah, I, I've been at a few AAA games this summer, and it, you know, I, I like the one. I'm, I'm with Mark. Like, there's when the batter's just, you know, tapping his helmet that he wants to challenge. It, it, it can, it's, it's fast, right? It's, it's just like, just like Wimbledon, you know, like tennis majors, where you just, you know, I'm, I'm challenging the line call. They replay the line call. You know what happened. You move on, right? It's a good thing, but I do think there'll be a lot of controversy with it because part of it is the batter has to challenge it immediately, right? And there's certain guys that certain managers are not going to give that right to, right? Like, right. You're not challenging. You're not wasting our challenges. You don't get you're a mad. challenge. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's you're like, in the nine hole for a yeah, reason. Yeah, you got a terrible eye. We're not going to give you the challenge, and yet yeah. guys are going to be up there wanting to tap their helmet. You only get three. You keep them if you if you get them right, but you lose them if you get them wrong. So. I saw a couple where you could tell the the manager got ticked that the guy had challenged a pitch that was pretty borderline and turned out to be the strike that the umpire called. You can get you can get some pretty hot water pretty quickly with your manager if you're, sure. if you're up there tapping your helmet on on without without knowing exactly what you're looking at. Well, those are the ones where in other sports, you know, they've realized you gotta you gotta penalize players and teams for challenging. Right. You know, like even if it's five seconds, that's still five more seconds of people's time that. Wasn't there if you didn't challenge, right? And if you're just challenging because ah, we got a challenge. Like I hate that in the NBA. Ah, oh, we yeah. got a challenge left. Just try it. It's like, what? Why? And, like, and the most so absurd stupid. calls. The most absurd Always. calls that you know are not getting over. You hear it. You're like, well, it's a two possession game. There's twelve. You got. You might as well try it. And like, there's no. Why? No. Like, what do you mean? You might as well try it. I know. Like, and that. That's the kind of stuff that drives me crazy. And also this idea that. You know, let's say you get three challenges. So there's only three pitches that really matter. You know, like what if you've wasted them and then you get to the bottom of the ninth and there's a pitch that should be challenged. Gotta like save your challenges. I know, but then that Gotta becomes a challenges. part of the strategy. It's not yeah. timeouts. You know, like in football, that's a great part of football is like you evaluate how a coach uses his timeouts. Mm -hmm. Like it's actually a really, really cool kind of geeky part of the oh, game yeah, for the sure. viewing experience. You know, the idea that you're challenging, you wasted challenge, but that means it lets the ump off the hook later if he gets it wrong because you didn't have your challenge. I don't know. It's a slippery slope for me. I mean, I, I've been on record about this for years. I, I, I'm not for it at all. For you up just to want me, human it, error. Keep human, human error is fine. Brain. Human error is fine, yeah. man. I, I find it, what goes around generally comes around – Baseball, it's a little bit different with a strike zone because it is black or white now with technology. Like, they can pretty much – it's just like tennis. Like, you actually yeah. can know specifically. But a lot of the, the subjective calls, you know, in hockey, you see it all the time. Goaltender interference, they don't know what the hell oh, they're that, reviewing. Yeah. They don't have a clue That's what they're crazy. reviewing. And it changes every single time. So, what's the point? Just get rid of it. You're just bothering people and wasting time. Yeah, when it's an opinion, when the call is an opinion, then yeah. you're right. It's useless. But yes. you're, uh, but in this case, you're, you're right. Like with 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 the strike zone, you know there is some you dispute can see about it. There's some what science to it. Yeah, there there is some dispute about what it should be. But if you just define what it is, you know, in this in this game, this is the strike zone, and this is how big it is, and and it's it's the same for everybody. Then, I, you know, yeah. there's no, it's pretty hard to argue. Well, I, I guess my take on that is, if you're going to go down that road and start challenging, just go to the robot robot umps. Like yeah. that's where you're going anyway. You're just you're slowly easing into it because the umpires have the union and you know you've got agree agreements with them and you, there's history there and umpires and player and who are the managers going to battle with and all that kind of stuff. But if you're already going to technology to challenge it and you're admitting the technology is better than the human eye, yeah, uh, then just get o get it over with. Yeah. You know it's going to happen anyway. I think just you're right. I think ups. that's and that's kind of my observation is that you're going through all this rigmarole. And to your point. Oh, you could have some. You could waste all your challenges, and then you're going to have a call at the most important high leverage moment of the game, and you're not going to have a challenge. The ump's going to blow it, and there's going to be a massive controversy about the fact that there was clearly a ball that was called a strike, and mm -hmm. you couldn't challenge it. So why not just go to robo ump's? And I think that'll be the argument, right? Eventually. And that's probably what will end up happening yeah. anyway.
Uh, we'll come back and wrap up the show. Tee up again. Canada versus Nigeria tonight. The Women's World Cup kicks off on TSN. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on the TSN app. Now, back to Overdrive with Hayes, Noodles, and the O-Dog. All right, Canada, Nigeria tonight. We're looking forward to it. We got the Open Championship, which uh, my boy Tommy Fleetwood, 500 today, Dave. I like it. The Pro-Am at the Canadian Open was the turning point for him. That's right. Playing alongside you and Lawrence Applebaum. He's been very good ever since. He was obviously in the playoff there with Nick Taylor. He had himself a great week in uh, Toronto, and he's carried that over. He he had a pretty good week uh, in a bunch of these tournaments throughout the way, and now he's at his own Open Championship, right? He's an Englishman. He's from Liverpool or just outside. He's a big Everton fan. Yeah. Big Everton fan. Going to be a lot of fans uh, cheering him on. But don't overlook your boy Victor Hovland because if it's good luck <laughs> to get, uh, let's say, deposited on right. by a certain type of bird near the sea, he got deposited on he by sure a did. bird. Yeah, he handled it pretty well. Yeah. Right? He backed off, said, man, can you believe basically in not these words, what the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Something happened here. Just say it's good luck, Hayes. Well, I don't it know. Could be. Seems like bad luck to me. I mean, it's never happened to me. Maybe that's why things I haven't gone my that. way lately. But I don't recall it happening to me either. But who knows? Maybe tonight. Maybe into tomorrow, Dave. Anything's possible. You never know. right? Anything's possible. All right, buddy. Great stuff. Appreciate you doing this. Great seeing you. As always, there's Dave Festchuk of the Toronto Star. Thanks to everyone behind the scenes for helping out. Everyone for tuning in today. Radio, TV, podcast, web, wherever you happen to find the show. We appreciate it. We're out of here. Enjoy your evenings. Enjoy the games tonight. We're back tomorrow at 4 p.m. We'll chat then.